Kensington Temple, a church community that the Lord has used powerfully over many years, that there are people serving the Lord in nations of the earth because of what God has done in this place. There are stories of generations of families that have been impacted by the power of the gospel because God has done wonderful things here in this place. And I believe that I've got an encouragement for you today. So we're going to look at God's word in just a moment. And the encouragement I want to bring to you is because I'm convinced that God has even greater things ahead for this church community. I believe the best is yet to come. I believe that there are purposes of God. As we were worshiping in the first service, I sensed like an angelic presence swirling around this room, wanting to release the gifts of God, the supernatural, to bring transformation into more and more hearts so that more and more people will be sent to the nations. I believe the best is yet to come. The glory of the latter house is greater than the former. And I believe God is wanting to do something in this season and in this time. Everything God does is good. And you see, when God has good plans, there is an evil adversary that wants to thwart the purposes of God. But God is always good, and He always does good things. And at this time, in this season, we know that the enemy doesn't come to take away our past of what has happened. The enemy comes to divert us and to steal the future. And God has good things in store for this place. He has good things in store for you, for your family, for your communities, for the nations that some of you will return to and take the gospel in renewed vigor and power. God has good things in store. And if you think for one moment that is not going to be contested by the enemy, then I hope you hear this with a spirit of encouragement. But the enemy is going to test and he is going to try to thwart he, ro- he roams around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And make no mistake about this, he wants to roar around this church community and he wants to stop the purposes of God. And this morning I want to share a few things with you that will help you understand how you can ensure the enemy doesn't get his way. Amen. Because God is good. Our brother knows this from the 90s. God is good. Ah, you know it as well. And all the time, God is good. Wonderful. You and I are afforded a choice in life. Jesus often talked about choices, pathways. There's the wide path, the way of the world. There's the narrow path, the way of the kingdom. And you and I have a choice, a choice of aligning ourselves to the goodness of God or aligning ourselves to our own way. And for these next few moments, I want to look at when we follow the master builder God, we can know the partnership of our lives with that which is good. We see at the very beginning of creation, God using the declaration that something was good. Genesis 1, 31, it says this, God saw all that he had made and said it was very good. Then later, Isaiah the prophet prophesied these words that Jesus stood up in the temple and he read from a scroll, Isaiah 61, and it says this, verses 1 to 3, the Spirit of the Lord, of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring Come on, say that again, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair, And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. Jesus came to bring 
good news. He went proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And you and I were recipients of this good news. Amen. Amen. Has anybody been transformed by the power of this good news? Anyone known the oil of joy in your life? Anyone know the healing, the broken hearts, the restoration? You see, because we are the workmanship of God, and Philippians 1.6 says these words, being confident of this, that he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. He will be faithful to complete it. He never starts anything that he doesn't complete. If we will work with him, he will complete that which he starts. And that's why it opens up that verse with being confident, not of our own power, not of our own might, not of our own competencies, but being confident that he finishes because we are his good workmanship. So God is good. He makes good things. He carries good news for all, and he is doing a good work in us. But I'm going to take you now to an occasion in the Old Testament when there were some elements that seemed to be very good things, but that God declared that they weren't good. And we're going to look at the mystery of some of these things because they are areas that are um, communicated in this world as positives. And there are actually things in the Scriptures that are declared as positives, and yet we see them, and God doesn't say they're good. Let's look a little bit further at this, because we live in a world of relative truth and opinions, in a world where people are fixed on doing what is right in their own eyes. And that's not a new phenomenon. You go back to the book of Judges, and it was declared time and time again, they did what was right in their own eyes, their own truth, their own identifying with the things that they thought were the most important to them. And God gives us a choice that we either go with our truth or we go with his truth. And in this day, there is a need for the church to know who's good is being declared over our lives. Because there are some things you can declare over your life that society will say, yeah, that's good. Well done, Kensington Temple. Well done, Bill. Well done, George. Well done, Judith. And there are other people who will declare good over your life, but it's not their good that you and I want to have. It's the good of God. It's His declaration. He w- we want Him to look at our lives, to look at our activities, to look at our business, to look at our families, to look at our churches, and we want to hear Him say, well done. That's good. That is good. I haven't watched it for a few years, but X Factor, you know, that Saturday night TV program, there's four judges, and you get people walking onto that big stage, and you never quite know what's going to come out next. Usually the bigger the sob story, the more votes they're going to get, but we see them walking onto that big stage, and sometimes you think, why has no one told them that they can't sing? You know, why? And you just imagine their mum saying, oh, you've got a wonderful voice, you should go on the X Factor. And they can't sing. Someone should have told them. But then you've got these four judges. And you just know the order is always going to mean that there's one ju- the same judge is going to give his comments last. Simon. <laughs> and they sing, or they do their performance, And then they go to judge number one, judge number two, judge number three. And it doesn't matter what they say. You can see the contestant waiting for Simon's response. Even if the other three say, that is good. And Simon says, that was not good. It devastates their world. They don't think I got three out of four. They think Simon didn't like what what I did. You know, in our lives, there are many opinions but it's only God's that you and I should live for. We should live to hear his well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful. Faithfulness in today's world is not a fashionable thing. We move around, we swap, we change, we have innovation, but faithfulness is a characteristic of God and God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, some of you have been faithful for many years now. And you have served the Lord in adversity. 
You've served the Lord in painful seasons. And I want you to hear that things may have not worked as you hoped they would, but the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. But the story we're about to read has three applauded areas that people in society will say, that's good. And yet God doesn't seem impressed. Let's not tease you any longer with that. Let's look at the story because it's found in Genesis 11. It's what's known as the Tower of Babel, the story of the Tower of Babel. And it says in verse 1, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. Now, I'm from Wales. I reckon that was Welsh. (laughs) I'm not making a theological point there before anybody writes in. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Sheena and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Now, let's look at these three things that get applauded. And they get applauded in the world, and they get applauded in the church. First one, unity. These guys were on the same page. They had the same activity. They were excited by the same thing. They spoke the same language. They communicated and connected with unity. And do you know that the Bible applauds unity? Of course you do. Psalm 133 says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We read the Apostle Paul writing regularly to the New Testament church, appealing for them to be united, to put aside their differences, their disputes, and their quarrels, and to sort it out for the sake of unifying. Unity is important to God. Unity is attractive to God. Unity is blessed by God. But in the Tower of Babel story, even though there appears to be unity, we don't hear God say, it is good. The second thing in this story as well as unity is there's innovation. They were using the latest technologies for construction. They weren't chiseling rocks They weren't pulling stones out of the ground. They were making bricks. Now, God loves innovation. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's unchanging, but it says in the Scripture, see, I am doing a new thing. He's always up to something new. And you might be adverse to the changes. Um, We use regularly now in prayer gatherings, we use technologies, video call technologies like Zoom. Do you, did you grow up going to Sunday school and singing that old song, I'm going to zoom, zoom, zoom around the room, room, room? Do you remember that? We all do the signs of aeroplanes and we, I'm going to zoom, zoom, zoom around the room, room, room. I'm going to zoom. We had no idea. It was prophetic. <laughs> we had no idea that we were singing about video call. But I'm so glad today that we've got people in their 80s and 90s in the church that are now with their iPads joining into our Zoom prayer gatherings. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful that we can find these advances. And there's, you know, technology is usually amoral. It's neither good or bad. It depends on how you use it. But we struggle with change, don't we, so often? But Jesus is always doing a new thing. He's at work in a new way. And the old adage that some of us who don't like change might hide behind that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Well, I'm pretty pretty pleased this morning that somebody didn't live subject to that adage and we're not still arriving on horses this morning. You know, I'm sure you're glad that you came on the tube or the train or you drove in or you walked in and that those advances in technology have enabled you to find a different way of doing things. Innovations lead into the possibilities of tomorrow, and I love seeing God's people step out in innovation. There was innovation in this story. They were making bricks in a way that didn't usually happen, and yet we don't read God saying, it is good. 
Then there was a third element to this story, as well as unity and innovation. There was vision. Vision is good. Vision paints the picture of a new tomorrow. It engages our lives today so that we can participate in building something new for the future. Vision is grand, and there was a grand expression of vision in this story. They wanted to build a tower that stretched into the sky. I'm sure if they were to see some of these towers in nations like Dubai today, they might say, yeah, that's the sort of thing we're thinking of, something grand and big. And they were ambitious, and they were bold, and the whole community was inspired around this vision. In fact, we see that the Word of God, Proverbs 29 says, without a vision, the people perish. Vision's good. God paints a picture in our mind of a new tomorrow, and he engages with us to help that become a reality. God gave Abraham a vision that he would have descendants as numerous as the earth. God gave Moses a vision that the Israelites would be set free from the tyranny of Egypt. God gave David a vision that there would be a temple that was constructed as a place of worship and the presence of the Lord. And there are many others throughout history. God has stirred people generation after generation to be envisioned, to work towards partnering with the Spirit for a new tomorrow. Vision's good and it's applauded. I've read books on vision, Christian books. I've been to Christian conferences, ministry conferences on how to get a vision, how to have a bigger vision. And I think vision is important. But in this story, they had a big vision, but God didn't say it is good. So in this story, we have unity, we have innovation, and we have vision. These three elements that a church might say, if we've got all three of these things, we are going to be a going places. But you can have all three of these things and not hear God declare it is good. Let's look at what else is said in this story. Because if we read on from verse 5, we see a little bit of what's next. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. And the Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so they will not understand one another's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, it is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. God wasn't impressed. Why? Well, let's put some context. Because sometime before this, and there's some dispute around the exact time, but say 100 years before this, there was a major event that happened. And that was, there was a big flood. Noah built the ark. And in this story, in this account of the Tower of Babel, we have these people with that legacy of that story that would have been passed on. It was far enough away to not be their experience, but it was close enough to have been passed on as a concern. And they begin to engage in something in response to that. Now, first of all, let's look at the unity thing because we do see that God is affirming that unity is powerful. He says that nothing they do will be impossible if they are as unified as they are. Unity is powerful. But the big question is not are we united, but what are we united around? That's the key thing. That's the question. We've got criminal gangs in this nation who are united around certain things. It's not unity, it's what we're united around that's important to God. Secondly, their, their innovation. Let's look at this. They were making waterproof bricks. Why do you think that was? Why do you think they were constructing in a way that was going to repel the water? They were saying, God... If you flood this earth again, you will not get us this time. And the vision to make a tower that stretched to the heavens, we are going to get ourselves above the waterline, God. 
We're going to make a waterproof construction that will escape you. Well, there's something really important to know here. And that is that God had already promised that he would not flood the earth. And every time a rainbow came in the sky, that promise was reaffirmed. You know, I've met people over the years who have got promises of God on their life. And, and I understand that the delay and the time causes them to be worried and concerned that it may never happen. And so they begin to go rogue and to develop their own strategy. I've met people who are desperately saying, God, would you provide a husband for me or a wife for me? And they keep praying and trusting, and God has spoken over them and given them a promise, but it's just never happened. And so they begin to look outside the purposes of God. And it's never a good place to look. The best place in your life is holding on to the promises of God and not going rogue. If you and I can hold on to the things that the Lord has spoken over us, that's why the best promises are the ones in here. If we can hold on to this word, and you know, your circumstances may look like they are going in the opposite direction to the word of God. And it's at that time that we persevere and we hold on and we say, God, Right now, it looks like the hardest thing in the world to do is to trust you. And that is exactly the thing that you and I need to do, to trust him with all of our heart, to lean not on our own understanding, to acknowledge him in all our ways, and he will make that pathway straight. See, what they were doing in this story, they were basically declaring independence from God. They were saying, we can do it without you, God. We'll unify We'll be innovative, we'll be full of vision, and we'll do it without you. We'll, in fact, we're going to escape from you. King David, in Psalm 139, he said these words. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You can't escape the presence of God. So don't run. Stop running. Yield, surrender. We can be united, innovative in vision, but God looks deeper. He lifts the bonnet of our lives and he looks into the heart and he looks at our motives. He's doing this across his church today. Across the nations of the earth, there's a shaking taking place in the church. And some of it's the enemy, but some of it's God shaking his people. God is calling his church to lift up the hood and to look at what's underneath. To let him search me, oh God. See if there be any offensive way within me. You see, because God is not impressed by our gatherings. He's not impressed by how engaged we are with some of our community projects and our activities. All those things are good. But what God is impressed with is our hearts. God sees our motives, and it causes him to either shake us or to declare these words, it is good. There's one more layer in the story. Not only were they declaring independence from God, but they were also looking to become famous. There was a poll taken by the U.S. Today and this poll revealed that the majority of today's young people want to be famous. But this is not a new phenomenon. Those building this tower thousands of years ago, they wanted to become famous. Let's build this so that everyone will see us. They wanted to make a name for themselves. No church, no minister, no ministry, no business that surrender to God, should aim to make a name for themselves. 
If we don't allow the fruit of the Spirit to self-control, give self-control to our hearts, to guard our motivation, to stop our hearts being tempted, then we run the risk of building a tower that's for us to impress rather than impress the Lord. I've been married 32 years. Thank you for those who said I don't look old enough. That's very kind of you. I got married young. I knew that I was going to lose my hair quite young, so I thought I better, I better get in there quickly, you know? And man, she is beautiful and gorgeous. I fell in love straight away with Nita, and it's just beautiful. And over the years, I've learned that there are times and occasions when it's nice to surprise her, not to just do the predictable cards for birthdays and flowers for anniversaries, but to do some of those nice things when they're not expected. It means a lot. I see some nudges going on right now. <laughs> I, I convinced her that, you know, flowers on Valentine's Day is predictable and double the price. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to get them other days. So there are occasions over our 32 years of marriage I've bought flowers. And you know, on those occasions, I've gone into the florist and I've walked around the florist and I've chosen a bunch of flowers and I've picked them up and I've taken them in my hands to the counter and I've taken the wallet out of my pocket and I've paid for the flowers and then I've walked to the car and I've got in the car and I've put the flowers in the boot and then I get home and I lift the boot and I take the flowers out and my feet take me on with my legs into the house and I unlock the door with my hand and I walk into the home where Nita is and I present the flowers to her and her heart melts. Then I realized I forgot to take the reduce sticker off. <laughs> and I, with my hands, I hand the flowers over. In every occasion I've done that, she has never, ever looked at my feet and said, the way you walked and supported the legs in picking and choosing and bringing those flowers to me is amazing. Well done, feet. <laughs> She's never looked at my legs and said, the way that you moved to bring those towards me, wow, such skill. She's never looked at my hands and said, that is the nicest way you've ever handed them to me. She's never done that. Every time she looks at my face, and she looks in my eyes and she says, thank you. The scripture teaches us that the church is the body of Christ and he is the head. Everything we do is so that people see the head and bring glory to him. If you're trying to get your significance through your reputation, if you're trying to go all bross on us and when will I, will I be famous? <laughs> you miss the point. We're called to be unified. We're called to be innovative. We're called to be envisioned so people will see him. So they will look at the church and they will see Jesus. They will look at the church and they will see Christ, our Savior. And they'll join in the song of Yeshua. Holy, holy. I pray that as we give our lives to the Lord, that whatever comes our way, that we will serve Him. I pray that 
Kensington Temple won't be famous in Kensington. I pray that Jesus will be famous in Kensington. I pray that Kensington Temple won't be famous in London, but Jesus will be famous in this city among the nine million people who live here, that the nations of the world will have Jesus being made famous to them for who he is, for what he does, that the nations of the world will declare that he is good. He is good. I'm going to ask the band to come back and join us. Psalm 127 says these words, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Jesus said, I will build my church. You notice the ownership there? I will build, who said that? Jesus. Who owns the church? Jesus. This church is not Elim's church. Yeah. It's not the elders' church. Yeah. It's not the pastor's church. This church is Jesus' church. Yeah. It belongs to him. Yeah. It's to make him famous. Yeah. It's to honor his name. Yeah. And he's looking for partners. He's looking for those who will say, I surrender all to serve a good God in building a good church for the honor of his name. We're called to serve him. And as we partner with him, may he declare over all of our lives, it is good.